is Christy DeLemus, and I am president of the World Federation of Neuroscience Nurses. I want to welcome you to our training course on neuroassessment. Neuroassessment is a critical skill for all nurses who care for neurological patients. It can help you to detect neurologic problems and monitor their progression. The initial assessment should be a comprehensive exam covering the following areas, mental status and level of consciousness, cranial nerves, motor strength, sensation, gait and balance, and reflexes. This initial exam will help to establish a baseline with which to compare all future assessments. This video will teach you how to perform a complete neurologic assessment in five easy steps. Let's start with mental status. Level of consciousness and mental status are the most important parts of the neurologic exam. Changes in level of consciousness or mental status are often the first signs of clinical deterioration. When assessing level of consciousness, there are several tools that you can choose from. Today, we'll focus on the Glasgow Coma Scale since it's the most common tool used. The Glasgow Coma Scale is made up of three patient responses, eye opening, motor response, and verbal response. The patient receives a score for their best response in each of these areas, and the three scores are added together. The total score will range from 3 to 15. The higher the number, the better. A score of 8 or lower indicates coma. When considering the prognostic value of the GCS, please keep in mind that the motor score is the only component that truly predicts clinical outcome. Assess the verbal score by standing at the bedside, calling the patient's name, and asking them to tell you where they are. You can simultaneously evaluate eye opening and orientation. Assess response in an unconscious patient by applying pressure to the trapezius muscle and observing the patient's response to it. Central stimulation produces an overall body response and is more reliable than peripheral stimulation for this purpose. We recommend squeezing the trapezius muscle. Supraorbital pressure is another option for central stimulation. However, avoid using this on patients with facial fractures or vagus nerve sensitivity. You can also assess for aphasia and cognitive function by adding a few open-ended questions. Examples include, tell me why you were here, and how did your symptoms start? Ask the patient to repeat a set of words, apple, table, penny. Let's watch as the GCS is assessed in both conscious and unconscious patients. Hi, my name is Christy. I'll be doing your neuro assessment today. I'm going to ask you a few questions that help us to understand how you're doing. Let's start with your name. David. And David, what month is it? September. And what year is it? 2014. Where are you at right now? UC Davis Medical Center. Can you give me a thumbs up? Great. I'm going to ask you to remember some words, and I'd like you to repeat them back to me. Apple, table, penny. Apple, table, penny. Okay. Mr. Smith, I'm going to take my time here to examine you. Can you open your eyes, please? Mr. Smith, open your eyes. Mr. Smith, open your eyes. So since he has no response, I'm going to check his motor response to painful stimuli. Mr. Smith, open your eyes. Mr. Smith, could you stick out your tongue or wiggle your thumb? Stick out your tongue or wiggle your thumb. Now let's watch some examples of patients with abnormal mental status. Okay, can you spell world? Double U R 
all day. Very good. Can you spell world backwards? The oh oh yo double yo. Okay. Can you start with the month of December and name the months backwards? December, March, April, May, June, July, August. Okay. Can you start with September and go backwards? September, October. No, go no. backwards. Can you go backwards? No. That's hard. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's fine. Next, we will evaluate cranial nerve function. There are 12 cranial nerves, although generally we only assess 9 or 10. The sense of smell or olfactory, formal vision testing, and gag reflex are generally omitted from normal patients. The eyes are a very rich source of information that can tell you many things. For example, forced gaze deviation can suggest seizure or massive hemispheric injury. The eye movements should be tested in all of the cardinal gaze positions to evaluate the function of cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6. Visual fields are also tested looking for field cuts by holding up both hands in the peripheral field of vision. Each eye is tested individually. The upper and lower quadrants are tested systematically. A homonymous hemianopia may suggest occipital infarction, but a superior quadrantinopia may point to damage in the temporal lobe. Cranial nerve 3 also controls pupillary reflex. To test the pupillary reflex, shine a pen light directly into each eye and observe for contraction of the pupil in response to light. The contralateral eye will also constrict, which is called consensual response. Cranial nerve 5 has three branches that provide sensation to the face in the forehead, cheek, and jaw. It's tested by applying a cotton tip applicator in each of the divisions and comparing side to side. It's important to ask, does this feel the same or different, since this question will identify subtle sensory loss. The motor branch of cranial nerve 5 is tested by asking the patient to clench their jaw while palpating the temporalis and masseter muscles. Facial strength, the seventh cranial nerve, is tested by asking the patient to show me your teeth or give me a big smile. Evaluate for symmetry. In particular, you want to watch closely for flattening of the nasal labia fold that suggests mild weakness. The eighth cranial nerve is tested by leaning close and whispering words into each ear with the contralateral ear covered. Compare each side and note any unilateral hearing loss. Cranial nerves 9 and 10 have a motor and sensory component. To test the motor division of cranial nerve 9 and 10, ask the patient to open their mouth and say, ah. The palate should rise symmetrically and the uvula should be midline. With unilateral weakness, the uvula will elevate towards the normal side because of unopposed muscle strength. The gag reflex tests both the motor and sensory branches of cranial nerve 9 and 10. It is tested by touching the back of the throat with a tongue depressor and observing for elevation of the palate with gag. Cranial nerve 11 evaluates innervation of the trapezius muscles. It's tested by asking the patient to shrug their shoulders and turn their head against resistance. Cranial nerve 12 is tested by asking the patient to stick out their tongue and move it from side to side. Observe for atrophy and fasciculations. In unilateral weakness, the tongue will deviate toward the weak side. Now let's watch some examples of patients with abnormal cranial nerve exam. Open your eyes wide. Okay. All the way over, all the way back, all the way over and up and down, coming back. Look over here. Quick look over there. Okay, quick look over here. Yeah, come on back. Now this is a relatively young patient who had acute onset of the third nerve palsy and when worked up was found to have a dolichoectatic basilar artery. Most likely it was compressing the left third nerve because this pu patient had pupillary involvement. 
the pupil is relatively involved on the left side. Going through ductions now, you can see that that left pupil doesn't medially duct, doesn't infraduct well either. You can see that it AB ducts quite well, six nerve function, and superduction is obviously impaired. Close your eyes really tight. Don't let me open them. He has weakness of the lower half of his left face, including that orbiculus oculi muscle, but sparing the forehead. So you got your tongue all the way out. Okay, and then all the way out as, as far as you can. See if you can get all the way out of your chin here. Good. I want you to move your tongue over here to the left, to the right side. I want you to move over to the left, over here again, and over here again. Okay. And I want you now to stick it all the way out. I want you to push against the tongue blade. And I want you to push over here, the other side now. All the way over here. And only push it back. Push it back. Okay, and over here again. And let me push it back. Push it back. Okay, good. Let's move to the motor exam. To evaluate the ability to move on command, the patient must be awake, willing to cooperate, and able to understand what you are asking. With the patient in bed, assess motor strength bilaterally. Have the patient flex and extend their arm against your hand. Squeeze your fingers. Lift their leg while you press down on their thigh, hold their leg straight, and lift it against gravity, and flex and extend their foot against your hand. Grading skills help us to standardize exams between examiners. As part of the motor assessment, also check for arm pronation or drift. Have the patient hold their arms out in front with the palms facing to the ceiling. If you observe pronation, a turning inward, of the palm or the arm, or the arm drifts downward, it means the limb is weak. Now let's watch some examples of patients with loss of motor function. Put that little piece of paper and put it in. Good, if you can. That's pretty hard for that little piece of paper, isn't it? Okay, now can you move your thumb out? Okay, can you squeeze down on my finger? Give me a good squeeze, hard as you can, good. Now can you lift this hand up? And can you put it down? And I lift it up again, and don't let me push down. Okay, that's good. Can you rotate this hand? Can you go the other direction? Okay, and pull it up. And keep it up and don't let me pull and push it down. Push it down. Good. And bring this arm up like this to your up out. Don't let me push it down. Okay. Now this one, let's have you squeeze my finger tight. Good. And bring it up like this. Good. Hold it up like that if you can. And close your eyes and hold still. Okay. Open up your eyes. What I want you to do is I want you to just pull up on this leg. Just, you know, don't let me push down. Good. And this side, don't push down. Good. And I want you to squeeze on my hands really tight. Don't let me push out. And pull out like this. Don't let me push in. Good. And straighten this leg all the way out. Don't let me push down. And this side, don't let me push down. Good. Now, on your foot, can you lift this foot up? No. That's really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you push down? Hard to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you bring this over? Don't let me push out. Okay. Don't let me push in. A little bit more strength there. Okay. Can you bring your toes up at all? No. Okay. Let's do this side. Push down on my hand. Pull. Bring up your foot. Don't let me push down. Good. And bring your foot over here. Don't let me push down and bring it out. Don't let me push over. Good. Next, we will evaluate sensation. 
The sensory exam evaluates the patient's ability to perceive and identify specific sensations. It's an essential part of the exam in some patients, such as spinal cord injury. Begin at the face and move systematically down the body, comparing one side with the other. Assess sensation to light touch using your fingertips or cotton. Always ask the patient, does this feel the same or different? Not, do you feel this, since that question provides no diagnostic data. Test superficial pain sensation with a clean, unused safety pen. Be sure not to break the skin and discard the pen appropriately after you finish using it. Since pain and temperature run down the spinothalamic tract, there's no need to repeat the temperature exam. Test proprioception or position sense by moving the patient's toes and fingers up or down. Grasp the digit by its sides and have the patient tell you which way it's pointing. Now let's watch the sensory exam. Next, I'm gonna test your sense of position. I'm gonna have you close your eyes. Is this up or down? Down. Up. Down. 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 Up. Down. Down. Now let's watch some examples of patients with loss of sensation. Is, is this sharp here any different than this sharp over here? Yes. Okay, what's different? I can feel it better over here. Okay, so is, that's different there than over here? Yes. How about um, down here, over here, versus over here? It's sharper on this leg. Sharper on this leg, okay. And it's the same wherever I touch then. Mm -hmm. And how about down on your foot? Any? Mm -hmm. Sharper on Still right. sharper on this yes. side, okay. And less sharp over here. Yes. Okay. If I were to do on your trunk, on your stomach, how about sharper here versus over here? Sharper on the right side. On the right side. Mm -hmm. Where does it change as far like as? Right here. Okay. And then as far as coming up, it would still feel? It's still the same. Same up into where we hit where? About probably like right here. About right there. Okay. So I'm just going to do that right here. Tell me where it changes, okay? Mm -hmm. There. Right about here? And down a little bit further. Right here? Yeah. Okay. And then it's sharper up here than it is down here. Yeah. I'm going to move your toe a little bit down, a little bit up. You close your eyes and tell me which way I'm going. Down. Up. Up. Down. Okay. Now I'm going to move it. Down. Now you're going to move it. Up. Okay. Now. Down. Hold on. Now I'm going to move it again. Okay. Okay. Ready? Okay. Which way? Down. Okay. Now tell me which way. Up. Okay. Now tell me which way. I'm going to move it now. Down. Okay. I'm going to move it now. Up. Okay. Is it a little bit more difficult to tell this side? Yeah. Now let's test gait and balance. If the patient is not ambulatory, you may not be expected to evaluate gait and balance. In that case, limiting testing to coordination is acceptable. Hold up your finger and have the patient quickly and repeatedly move their finger back and forth from your finger to their nose. Then have them alternately touch their nose with the right and left index fingers. Finally, have them repeat these tasks with their eyes closed. The movements should be precise and smooth. To assess the lower extremities, have the patient bend their leg and slide the heel along the opposite shin from the knee to the ankle. This movement, too, should be accurate, smooth, and without tremors. If the patient is able to stand and not restricted to bed, you can evaluate their gait by observing for fluidity of movement, speed, any hemiparesis, spasticity, and arm swing. Now let's watch some examples of patients with abnormal gait and balance. Now walk back to the wall. Then say so walk back to the middle, and then walk over to the other side. Yeah, that side. There you go. 
and then walk back over here to this side, and then walk back over to the clear over the other side, and then walk back to the middle, and we're done. In the ataxic gait, the patient has difficulty narrowing the station and maintaining balance, so typically they'll have a wide stance is trying to maintain balance, and that there oftentimes will be uh, unsteadiness in the trunk. So there may be some trunkal titubation, which is an anterior posterior to have a tremor at about three hertz. And there's also a tendency to, to lunge or to uh, jerk sideways, and the patient then has to catch themselves. Now, of course, one of the ways to bring out this particular type of problem is to narrow the station asking the patient to walk tandem. So if I then am ataxic, I then try to walk tandem, then I'm going to have difficulty walking. Choreiform gait is a hyperkinetic gait seen with certain types of basal ganglia disorders. It's characterized by irregular, jerky, and voluntary movements. Reflexes are not routinely assessed, but they may provide important information in the setting of spinal cord injury or suspected brain death. The plantar reflex is the only superficial reflex that's commonly assessed and should be tested in comatose patients and in those with suspected injury to lumbar 4 or 5 or S12 areas of the spinal cord. Stimulate the sole of the foot with a tongue blade or the handle of a reflex hammer. Begin at the heel and move up the foot in a continuous motion along the outer aspect of the sole and then across the ball to the base of the big toe. The normal response is plantar flexion, curling under of the toes. Extension of the big toe, Babinski's sign, is abnormal, except in children younger than two years. You should also assess brainstem reflexes in stuporous or comatose patients to determine if the brainstem is intact. You'll check for protective reflexes such as coughing, gagging, and the corneal response as part of your cranial nerve assessment. To test the oculocephalic or doll's eye reflex, turn the patient's head briskly from side to side if there are no cervical spine contraindications. The eyes should move from the left while the head is turned to the right and vice versa. If this reflex is absent, there will be no eye movement. To test the oculovestibular reflex, also known as the cold caloric reflex, a physician will instill at least 20 mils of ice water into the patient's ear. In patients with an intact brainstem, the eyes will move laterally toward the affected ear. In the patient with severe brainstem injury, the gaze will remain at midlight. Now that you have completed your exam, it's important to document. Accurate and consistent documentation helps to ensure that subtle changes in neurological status are caught early. The neurologic exam can be complex, but it's essential to the diagnosis and treatment of a wide variety of neurologic conditions. With practice and repetition, you will become an expert in this life-saving skill. For more information on neurologic assessment techniques, please visit our website at www.wfnn.org or your national neuroscience nursing organization. Mm -hmm.